be what you will put on? Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you, by wearing, can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the valley, of the field. How they grow, they neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now, now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Today, I'd like to speak to you on um, the simple subject, destroying the spirit of anxiety. Destroying the spirit of anxiety. Anxiety and anxiousness. And, uh, and worry. Father, we come before you and we ask that your spirit would be upon us and that you would help us to deal with this subject in a way that would be pleasing to you. That the spirit of the people may be edified through your word and that you would be glorified. And I will thank you in advance. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. When we read through this text, we will find that Jesus pleaded with his disciples three times. And he says, do not worry. Do not worry. Do not be anxious. Um, in verse 25, Jesus says, do not worry about your life. And then in verse 31, do not worry saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? And then in verse 34, he goes ahead and repeats it again, and he says, do not worry about tomorrow. Well, when Jesus repeats himself multiple times in Scripture, more than likely it's because he is trying to emphasize a certain point. And the Jews did not use exclamation points like we do. And uh, to be honest, I think we overuse exclamation points. But the way they emphasized the point was through repetition. When they wanted to get someone's attention, they repeated themselves. So when Jesus called Mary, he didn't just call her once. He called her twice. Mary, Mary. And what he was saying is, whatever I'm going to tell you next, Mary, you need to pay close attention to because I'm emphasizing a point. And in essence, Jesus is telling his disciples this point about anxiety is very, but very important. And that's why I'm repeating it. I, I need you to pay attention to what I'm telling you about anxiety. And then Jesus repeats himself. And then he not only says the words, do not worry, but he also expresses and illustrates the same point in different ways using several different anecdotes. Now, why is this topic so important to Jesus? Why does the, 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 you know, he bring this point up so repeatedly in this passage? Why does he want his disciples to tie this, to, to take this topic uh, seriously? It would seem as though Jesus understands that as human beings, we are predisposed to anxiety and to worry and to panic. We are humans, humans who 
have absolutely no access to tomorrow, no access to our future. And then, therefore, we will always struggle with anxiety. We will always struggle to know what everything or how everything is going to turn out and that everything is going to be all right. Jesus knew that we would worry, that his disciples would worry about li their lives, about their health, about their jobs, about education and basic needs, about relationships and about businesses. He knew that there were people in this house even today that would read the scripture and are probably perhaps worried about children and so many more things that there are to worry about. It's all normal. And perhaps some of you came in here tonight, and many have come to service battling the spirit of worry and the spirit of panic and the spirit of anxiety over the raising of your children or perhaps over a conflictive marriage or perhaps over a job that is ca causing much stress or you're just worried about a court appearance or mountain debt or a gambling problem or the stress of having to provide for your family. And, uh, you know, uh, for single people in this house, perhaps you are worried about finding that romantic partner uh, so as to keep yourself from enrolling in the Catholic convent for nuns. You, you are worried. And so Jesus understands that. Jesus understands that these worries are normal in all of us. And so he reminds us repeatedly. He says, do not be anxious. Do not worry. And yet, this is my question tonight. My question is, why shouldn't we worry, Jesus? I mean, it, 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 you know that these are legitimate concerns in our lives. There had better be some good reasons for why we should not be stressed. Well, tonight I'd like to give you several points throughout the scripture for why we shouldn't be stressed. Jesus gives some answers, and he's going to answer our questions here to, as to why we shouldn't be stressed, why we shouldn't have anxiety. Number one, we might not get to all the points, but number one, he says, therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life. Why, Jesus? What? Don't worry about what you'll eat. Don't worry about what you will drink. Don't worry about your body, what you will put on. And here is the answer that Jesus gives. The number one answer he gives is this. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? And so the, the, the first answer that Jesus gives is this. You should not worry because you are not merely a, 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 a material and natural being, but you are a spiritual and an eternal being. L listen to what Jesus is telling his disciples. Yes, in order to live in this material world, you need food. And yes, in the physical realm, you need clothing. Unless, of course, you're a skinny dipper or a streaker or a married couple. Listening to Marvin Gaye. You need clothing. And so, if you're underage, please go to your class. So you're not subjected. You're not subjected to a material world. But however, what Jesus is saying, though, is listen, how, you're not subjected to a material world. And you're not just limited to the physical realm. I, there is more to you than meets the eye. That's what Jesus is saying when he's saying the body is more than clothing. Life is more than food. What he's saying is in the physical realm, you need food and clothing. But in the spiritual realm, you're not just a physical being. You are a spiritual being. So therefore, there is more to you than food. There is more to you than clothing. There is more to you than drink. There is more to you than the things that meet the eye. 
And so we are spiritual and eternal beings. And so when our lives are characterized by anxiety in this natural world, then all we're doing is expressing how much importance we are giving to this fleeting, passing, and temporary world. Things have our utmost care. Things have become number one. And things have become priority in our lives. And we value things and stuff more than we value our soul and our spirit. And the fundamental defense against anxiety, according to Jesus, is our immortality. It is the fact that this world is not your home. It is the fact that, yes, go ahead and eat in the natural. Yes, go ahead and put clothes on in the natural. But know that life is about more than just food. Know that life is about more than just clothes. You are a soul and you are a spirit. And Jesus says, I came to give you not just life in this world, but I came that you may have a life eternal because you are an everlasting soul and he that believes in me he says shall never pass away and so what Jesus was saying is there is more to you than what meets the eye. There's more to you than what I can see and touch and hear and smell. Your senses cannot perceive the totality of who you are. You are more than what you can see in the mirror. And what you cannot see is of much more importance than what you can see. Because the spiritual realm is a whole lot more important than the physical physical realm. And so what does Jesus say in Luke 12? It's the same thing he's saying here. He says, and I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who can kill the body. And then after that, they have no more that they can do. Don't be afraid of those people that can kill the body. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who after he has killed uh, the body can also has power to cast you into hell. Yes, fear him, the one who can not just kill the body, but can cast you into hell. What was he saying? It's that the body, the realm, the physical realm that you're living in should not be what really scares you about your life. You are more than what you can see. It ought to be your spirit that you take care of. In other words, there are things far more important than what you look like. There are things far more important than what you wear, than what you eat, than where you live, than what you drive, than what you have in your bank account. There are things far more important than where you study. There are things that are far more important than that. Your soul and your spirit and your spiritual men are far more important than your body. Your body being killed is of much less important to Jesus than your souls being damned to hell because you're a spiritual being living a life here on earth, not just a natural being. And no wonder some of the first martyrs when they were being killed that would cry out and they were saying as they were being killed, you can kill us, but you can't harm us. Amen. You can kill us, but you can't harm us. What was he saying? Because they understood that not even death, according to Paul, can separate us from the love of Christ. Not even death, not even sword can separate you from the love of Christ because you are more than food and you are more than clothing and you are more than things and you are more than assets and you are more than money and you are more than what you put on and where you go and who, where you, you are more than this. That's the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we are eternal beings. As a matter of fact, 10,000 years from now, you're not going to be worried about who wrote what about you on Facebook. And look, look at what she wrote about me. And look, they're over here subtweeting about, and that tweet was about me and my family. You're not going to be worried about what people thought about you and what they said about you and who took what from you and what happened here. 10,000 years from now, when you're 
at the feet of the master when you're putting your hand on his side 10,000 years ago and that from now you're going to realize you know what my life was more than clothing my life was more than Gucci my life was more than boss my life was more than what I had on and what I drove and where I lived and what I ate my life was more than the physical realm and so Jesus said live in this life with that hope in mind live this life with that in mind that you are more than the things you are a spiritual being and you have eternal life in Christ Jesus. Praise the name of the Lord. Amen. Bless the name of the Lord. It's not things. Things can't hold me hostage, baby. Things can't hold me hostage. David said you can take everything from me, but don't take away from me your Holy Spirit. There is something about the Spirit. There is something about my internal being. Though my flesh it, it dies daily in decay. My spirit, my spirit is being fortified. My spirit is being strengthened day by day. And that's what's important. You are more than just a natural being. God, uh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. It's not really so much about, am I going to find a man or not? It, it really doesn't matter because in 20 years, you're going to lose sex appeal. In 20 years, he's going to die anyway. In 20 years, who really cares about? It's not really about the things that are happening right now. It, it, am I, it, whether you're ever going to find the man or why isn't Botox working on my wrinkles? Who really cares? Hey, man, there's going to come a day when this corruptible shall put on incorruption and this mortal shall put on immortality. So why do you care about these things when in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, and at the last trump, oh, the trump shall sound and we shall all be changed. And this body which was sown in weakness will be raised in strength. So why do you worry about this thing. Don't let these things hold you captive. Don't let these things hold you captive. Bless the name of the Lord. Well, Jesus, why else? Why shouldn't I worry? Why shouldn't I be anxious? And he said the reason why is because I am your caretaker. Amen. I am your provider. Does, is that not enough? I am your provider. Look at the birds of the air, he said. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they? Listen to what he's saying because there's a powerful inference that we should take from this verse. What he's saying is that God is so in control of the universe. I'm so in control of the universe's daily activities that it could be said of him that he feeds the birds. He even feeds the birds. Amen. In other words, every single worm and every single insect and every left of the french fry at the stadium, it was left there so that God could feed the birds. Amen. When that little carne asada got off your taco and fell, it didn't fall there by chance. It fell there so that God could feed the birds. God feeds the birds. My God. And that's such a powerful thought that God is a bird feeder. He, he is in the mundane things of a life. He feeds birds. And Jesus' point is simple. If God can feed animals who only have an involuntary relationship with their master, that is, they can't choose whether they praise or not. They have to, by virtue of their existence, they have to give him worship. How much more will he not feed those of us who have a choice? Those of us whom the devil have been trampling on you all week long, 
and yet you still made it to the house of the Lord on a Wednesday night. You had a choice whether you can come or not, but you came anyhow. You said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Birds have no choice, but you, you've been going through temptation. You've been going through trial and trouble and tribulation and vicissitude, and yet you are still in the house of God. You're still saying, I will bless the Lord at all times, and his praise shall continually be in my mouth. He said, how much more will I take care of you? When I take care of eagles and hawks and pigeons and the sparrow, I take care of them. They don't even worship me voluntarily, but you, my God, you came here with cancer. You came here with stuff all up, and you're still worshiping me. I will take care of you. Woo! Oh, bless the name of the Lord. You ought to give God some praise up in this house that he will take care of you. Woo! Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. As a matter of fact, when anxiety starts mounting up in your life, Jesus says, why don't you do me a favor? Open up the windows of your house. Open up the windows of your condo. Open up the windows of your apartment. Look out the window and hear the birds chirp. If the birds are still chirping who don't sow and don't reap, they don't gather in barns. In other words, birds who don't have a J-O-B are being fed by the master, are singing and praising as though they didn't have a care in the world. If birds are chirping while tornadoes are storming, if birds are chirping and it's raining out, and when you hear them chirp, then you go ahead and you sing along with him. Go ahead and say, why should I feel discouraged? And why should the shadows come? And why should my heart feel lonely? And long for heaven and home when Jesus is my portion. Woo! A constant friend is he. His eye is on the sparrow. And I know that he watches over me. His eye is on the sparrow. And I know he watches over me, over me, over me, over me. And so I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I am free. Because his eye is on the sparrow. Turn, turn to somebody and tell them his eye is on the sparrow. Woo! Bless the name of the Lord. You ought to sing with the birds. You ought to sing with the birds that his eye is on the sparrow. There's another reason that Jesus said you should not worry. And he said the reason you should not worry is because worry is absolutely worthless. That's what he said. It's worthless. And how do we know that, Jesus? He says, because which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to your stature? Do you know what Jesus was saying here? He's saying is, all anxiety is, it's an emotion. That's all that is. And emotions don't fix problems. Emotions don't free people from jail. Emotions don't pay the debt. Emotions don't heal a dying relative. Don't bring back our dead loved ones. And so emotions, they don't find jobs for you. Emotions can't do any of those things. And that's what Jesus meant when he said that you can't add a cubit. You can't add a cubit to your stature. When you were, if you can add to your stature by wearing, then I worried a whole lot. And some of you didn't worry at all. Amen. Good to see you, Pastor. Anyway, in other words, in the great scheme of things, worrying doesn't amount to a hill of beans because you can cry all night. 
But in the morning, the sick will still be sick. And the dead will still be dead. And your electricity will still be gone. Because your light bill will still be unpaid. Because your bank account will still be overdrawn. Because you got that new car that you couldn't afford. In other words, anxiety is absolutely worthless. It is fruitless. And that's why Charles Spurgeon said it this way, and I love this quote. Charles Spurgeon said, anxiety does not empty tomorrow of its sorrows, but it empties today of its strength. Anxiety does not empty tomorrow of its sorrows, but it empties today of its strength. That is, anxiety doesn't make tomorrow better. It just makes today worse. And worry doesn't kill the problem. It kills the person. It's not killing your problem. It's killing you. <laughs> well, Jesus, what else? Why should I not worry? And it's like, well, Jesus was going to tell you something else. And that's this, because worry reveals a lack of faith in the providence of God. Amen. See, faith is what pleases God. But a lack of faith, that is a lack of trust in the providence of God, displeases God. God. Amen. Why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? And listen to this, O oh, you of little faith. Do you know what he was saying? He was saying, your anxiety reveals a lack of faith. Oh God, lilies have a short lifespan. They do. But even though they're not made for long-term living, the Lord arrays them with great color. And God is excessive in the way that he dresses lilies who don't toil, who don't spin. In other words, they don't work nor stress. And now we that are eternal beings, we that have been made in the image of God, God, we, amen, worry while lilies that are temporary and short term, they don't toil. God is so detailed that he dresses lilies that will be cut and thrown into the oven and burned with delicate decor. And yet we, we worry. And it hasn't, you know, I don't know if it's gotten to you or not, but something about that is just wrong. Anxiety, worry and panic are all great indicators that reveal that we don't have enough faith in God as we think we do. If your faith was measured by your anxiety, how much faith would you have here today? Can I tell you what anxiety is? Anxiety is a slap to the face of God because I have boys and I'm telling you, if my boys ever got home and my boys went out in an all out panic and said, but dad, how are we going to eat and where are we going to live and, and how are we going to do what, what's going to happen tomorrow and what's you, you know what that would be that would be a slap to my face because I would all I'd have to say is look at my track record has daddy not provided for you in the past have I not put a, 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 a roof over your head and clothes over your back have I not fed you and fed you well have I not broken my own back so that I can feed you and do whatever it takes to take care of you. And so look at your father's track record. It is a slap in the face that you would give you, me, someone who has been there for you and provided over and over and over again. What you're telling me is you don't believe that I am able to provide for you. It's a slap in the face of God. 
And that's exactly what Jesus implies, that your level of faith is measured by your level of worry. Your level of faith is measured by your level of worry. Ye of little faith. Where else have we heard that? Do you remember when Peter was walking over the water and then he began to look around and, and the Bible says that when the storm came, he began to drown and he said, save me, O Lord, for I perish. And what did Jesus respond to Peter? Jesus said, O ye of little faith. O ye of little faith. Why? Because you paid more attention to things and the storm and there was a lack of faith in you when you did so. You were walking on the waters. Look at my track record, Peter. I've been good to you. I have provided for you, Peter. I've always been there for you, Peter. And now you are little faith. Your worry reveals a lack of faith in God. My God. See, the weight of gold, he said, not even Solomon dressed up like one of these lilies. Lilies that were to be cut down and thrown into the oven. Not even Solomon dressed up like one of these lilies. And the weight of gold that came to Solomon yearly, the Bible says, was 666 talents of gold. And I did the math on that. And that, just in gold alone, that's the equivalent in today's day of over $300 million a year. Over $300 million a year. And yet Solomon, the Bible says, could not dress like one of the lilies in the field. So how much more would he not dress and clothe you if he dressed lilies, if he dressed lilies with more decor and more beauty than Solomon could ever wear? How much more could he not dress you? Jesus, why else should I not worry? Why else should I not worry? And this is what Jesus says. Jesus says the reason you shouldn't worry is because worry reveals whether you are a born-again believer or not. <laughs> well, what do you mean? Well, this is what he says. He said, therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all of these things, the Gentiles seek. The Gentiles seek those things. You don't seek those things. You know what you seek? You seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then all of these things will be added unto you. The Gentiles seek things. You seek the kingdom. Gentiles seek things. You seek the kingdom. And the biggest sign that someone isn't born again is excessive worry. Be anxious for nothing, the Bible says. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your heart and mind through Christ Jesus. Be anxious for nothing. And this is the last one I will give you here tonight. The reason, and this is my favorite one, my favorite, absolutely favorite one, the reason you shouldn't worry is what Jesus says, he says, after all these things the Gentiles seek, but your heavenly Father knows that you have need of all of these things. That blesses me. That absolutely blesses me. And I'm going to tell you why that blesses me. <laughs> because he called God Father. You know why that blesses me? I'm going to tell you why. Because what he was saying was this. You are not an orphan. <laughs> You're not an orphan. You shouldn't worry. Why? Because you're not an orphan. You have a father. You have a father. You don't just have any father. You have a caring father. My God, my God, my God, the government shall be upon his shoulders. Amen. And, and what shall we call him? They said, wonderful counselor, mighty God. And then what? 
everlasting Father. Amen. He came unto his own. And his own received them not. But to them who did receive him, he gave them, he gave them the power to be called what? The sons of God. Beloved, now are we the sons of God of God. We have not received the spirit of fear, but the spirit of adoption, whereby we call him Abba Father. Abba, the Aramaic word for daddy. We call him Daddy Father. See, there's a lot of fathers, but there's not a lot of daddies in the world. But he said, when you approach me, I'm not just your progenitor. I'm not just the one that gave you life. I'm also your daddy. I'm also one who will care for you. Cast your cares upon me, for I will care for you. Amen. That's what he said. He said, I am a father. You are not an orphan. Stop kicking sand over on the side of the beach somewhere and saying nobody loves me and nobody knows the trouble I've seen. He said, there is a God in heaven who knows exactly who you are. There is a father. He He's a father. He's a loving father. He is one that will do anything to get to your need because he is daddy. I'm going to tell you why that ministers to me. That ministers to me because I am a father. And I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that if I ever hear my sons in trouble, my God, I will do anything to get to where my sons are. And I know that. And me being unrighteous, me being wicked, I give good things to my sons. How much more will our Father in heaven who is righteous and good and from, all, from whom all good things come will give the Holy Spirit to those who will ask it of him. He is daddy. He is father. And the other reason why is because I had a good father. I had a father who taught me the ways of the Lord. I had a father who prayed and read his Bible. I had a father who was also there for me and provided and put me through school. I had a father who prayed with me when I was lost and sick. I had a father who instructed me. I had a father who would wake me up and say blessed is the man who walked not in the counsel of the ungodly. I had a father, so I know what it is to have an earthly father who cares for you. How much more? I remember, I remember the time uh, I was growing up in the Bronx, and uh, you know, um, I was growing up in the in the rough part of the Bronx. It was called the South Bronx. The South Bronx was, is the home of hip-hop. It's where rap music uh, was started, actually. The South Bronx is the home of graffiti. The South Bronx, that's our claim to fame. The South Bronx is the home of yo mama jokes. <laughs> when I was growing up, I mean, and that's when it was, you know, yo mama jokes were like really hitting back when I was growing up. So I remember, you know, you didn't, you went to school and that's, that's how people got to school early because you got to school about an hour before school and everybody would get out, you know, and form this big old circle and there'd be two opponents that would come into the circle and go at it with your mama. Joy. That's how it started. That's how we all got it started, you know. And so we would say stuff like, oh, I'm not going to, I'm not going to. <laughs> yeah, I'd say stuff like, you know, yo mama is so cross-eyed that when she cried, her tears ran down her back. They call her bacteria. <laughs> but anyway, we, we would say stuff like that. But um, so I grew up in the Bronx, and I grew up in a bad neighborhood. My neighborhood was, I mean, you can find whatever you wanted. You didn't even have to li leave my building. You know, if you wanted, uh, it, it, it was by floors. 
uh, whatever drug you wanted, you already knew what apartment you needed to get to. Uh, you knew where the crackheads were. You knew where the prostitutes were. You knew anything that was wrong and bad and illegal and evil, you, you didn't even have to leave my building to get it. And so that's where I grew up, you know. And right in front of our place was this big park that I would play basketball in every single day after school. And so I was out there one day, and I was playing basketball, and I noticed all my friends left. And, you know, I was pretty naive. I was born in the church, so I, uh, you know, the, the worldly culture, I, I didn't have that. I was a, I was a good boy, and, um, and, and I, I, I just, I, you know, that stuff, I didn't get it. But all my friends left, and I thought, man, that's kind of weird. And then new guys came along, right? Well, I hadn't realized it, but these new guys weren't just any guys. This was a gang that had just come in, and uh, we would call it a posse, you know. So the, the posse would come in, and, you know, they were asking to play. It was my ball, and I, so I said, yeah, you know, I'm, I mean, I was being nice, and, and uh, so we began to play. But the more we played, <clears throat> the more I realized these guys, these guys are here for trouble. They're not just here for playing. They're here for trouble um, because, you know, they were picking a fight with me. And some of the younger guys were picking fights with me. So I began to, to, you know, to realize I think some of these guys are being initiated into this gang. And so, you know, I'm the, you know, they're supposed to uh, uh, get to me. Uh, and, and that became very apparent. And so I'm looking around and, uh, and I'm, I'm trying to figure out a way that I can leave. But it's my ball. So I, I don't want to leave my ball behind. And uh, I'm looking around, and I'm going, I, I need to leave this place. Well, suddenly, there was like uh, two of these guys that were coming against me. And so, you know, I'm, I mean, I was eight feet. So I was, I was looking down at them, and, uh, and, and I said, there's absolutely no way that these two guys are going to come again. You know, there were some of the smaller guys. So I wasn't afraid of them. But when they realized that I wasn't afraid of them, the whole gang ganged up on me. And they went back to the gate where they had dropped off their book bags and their bags and stuff. And I'm telling you, I saw bats and sticks and uh, uh, brass knuckles and knives and all sorts of weapons that came out of bags and stuff. And these guys were coming at me. I mean, these guys. And I, I remember grabbing my ball and I grabbed my backpack and I kept saying, I, hey, I, I don't want any trouble. But the more I said that, you know, they were scorning and laughing, and there were people that were surround. They were they're all surrounding me, and I would look to the buildings, and everybody was looking out of the windows, into the park where I was at, and no one was doing anything, but everyone was staring, almost as though they were looking for the popcorn to be entertained. And there was a lady that lived in our building. She lived on the sixth floor of our building. And she was the one that every drug dealer in town would pay, pay off because she lived on the sixth floor and her apartment, uh, her, the windows in her apartment faced both streets because it was a corner apartment so she could see both ways. So they would pay her to, you know, look out for police officers and detectives. And so she would be out of the, out her window day and night. There was not a moment that she wasn't looking out of her window. She'd be looking out of her window at all times. And we absolutely hated this woman. We hated this woman because she knew everybody's business. She never went out. I don't think she ever used the restroom, slept. I mean, we, you know, do you sit on a bucket? What are you doing? She was she would look out the window day and night. She knew everybody's name. She knew everybody's business. She knew, you know, what time this guy left, what time the other guy came in. She knew everything about everybody, and she knew everybody. And so no one would do anything. Now, on that day, I absolutely loved this lady because she was the only one that actually saw me and did something. And what she did, coincidentally, my father, who was uh, a pastor but also an auto mechanic, and uh, he, was, he didn't go into the office and he didn't go to the uh, shop on that day. He just happened to be outside working on a car's engine. And he had some friends with him. 
and they were all working on that car's engine. I mean, on that day, how, th this is like the greatest coincidence on earth. I mean, we know it's not a coincidence, but he was out there working on this car on that specific day. And all of his friends, by friends, by friends, I mean like hokamaniac type friends. These guys were out there and they were ready to rumble. There was one guy that was like by himself was like five guys. He was like 300 and plus of pounds and he was the type of guy that would be walking down the street and if a cop saw him he would say hey break it up break it up but anyway that was the type of guy he was this lady called out to my father and said your son is about to get killed and my father would tell me later that's what she said and I remember that as I was at the park my heart was beating. I was sweating. I was, I, was, I was getting ready to faint, and I knew that I was going to die. I was eight feet and trying to be strong, but I was about to faint. I was, I was looking around. My knees were giving way, and I didn't know what to do. And I didn't know. I knew if I ran that they were going to catch up to me, and I just knew I was going to die. And I didn't want to die like the little, you know, I didn't want to die screaming for help, you know. So I just... I, I just said, I'm just going to die, and I'm just going to die this way. But I remember all of a sudden, out of nowhere, out of nowhere, I hear this. And I know that whistle. I know that whistle. That was daddy's whistle. That was daddy's whistle. I remember when I heard that, it was like someone had given me the, the coldest drink of water in a desert, you know, that, that one could ever drink. And I remember something coming. It was like courage began to come from the, from, from the bottom of my feet all the way to the top of my head. And I looked back, and when I looked back, my dad was climbing over the gate, and he had tools. There's like oil and sweat and blood and manliness oozing. You know, the one that I had lost, there is the oozing from him. And then he had friends that were also coming behind him. And like Santa Claus was like three blocks away, but he was coming and, and they were all coming. And when these guys, I mean, these guys were like 16. I was like 13, 14. When these guys who, you know, was, were in their little posse saw these grown men with their uniforms and tools and all. So, get, get, guess what happened to me? All of a sudden, I, was, I went from fainting to actually coming around and going, hey, what up now? I took my ball, I took my backpack, I said, you got beef now, you got trouble now, come on out. And you know, you know what something, to I'm telling you, I'm telling you, at that moment, it was as though something got to my spirit and told me, at that moment that I heard my daddy's whistle, you know what got to my spirit? It was this, Loami, you are not an orphan. You are not an orphan. You have a daddy. You have a father who was willing to fight your battles. You have a father who was willing to die for you. You have a father who was willing to fight on your behalf. You have a father who will say, vengeance is mine. I'm telling you, and I'm preaching to somebody in here. You came to the house of God here today with worry and panic, and it seemed like all devils had surrounded you, and it seemed like life itself was about to drown you but I feel it in the Holy Ghost here on this Wednesday night would you open up your ears just a little bit and hear it with me in the Holy Ghost to you single mother who are raising who's raising your child children by yourself I hear a little whistle from I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. You are not an orphan, saith the Lord. You are not an orphan, saith the Lord. To you who have just been recently divorced and you don't know where to go or what to do, 
There's a God who's climbing over gates, who's climbing over fences, who's climbing over enemies, who's saying, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay, who's saying, oh, you will look towards the hills from whence cometh your help. Your help is in the name of the Lord. Your help is in the name of the Lord. There's a God who is saying, some trust in horses, some trust in chariots, but you shall remember the name of the Lord forever. For the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous shall run into it. They are saved. God, my God, so do not worry about tomorrow. Do not worry about your life. You are not an orphan. You are not an orphan. Would you lift your hands all over this building right now? Just lift your hands all over this building right now. I'm telling you, you are not an orphan in this house. Come on, lift your hands all over this building. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. You know, I'm preaching right now. I'm preaching right now to people who are going through all sorts of medical illnesses. And you're asking the question, why do I have to keep popping pills and injections and medical appointments? And I'm just, I don't know what else to do. I'm talking to you. You're not an orphan here today. Would you just come up? If that's you, you're not an orphan. And I'm talking to somebody in your relationship, romantic relationships, they're rocky, romantic relationships, and you just don't know how to keep your family together. and You don't know what to do in that sense. You're not an orphan. You're not an orphan. I'm talking to single parents here tonight. You're dealing with school, and, and you're dealing with food, and homework, and driving, and you're overwhelmed, and cleaning, and cooking, and laundry, and church, and church activities, and you just wish to God that you had help, but you feel like there is no help. You're not an orphan. There's a God who's come here to tell you, do not be anxious. I feed birds. I dress lilies. You're not an orphan. I'm talking to single men and single women. Sometimes the feeling and of needing companionship gets a hold of you. You haven't yet made it an idolatry. It's not necessarily that those things have taken a place of God in your life, but it's just that you're just human. <laughs> and you just need the warmth of another being whom you can confide in and talk to and, and love and be loved. You find yourself in places sometimes where you go, but God, will this ever happen for me? You're not an orphan. There's a God here today that's saying, I know your tomorrow. I have ordered your steps. I have given you enough strength for today. Don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will have its own worries. But I've given you strength for today. I've given you strength for today, for right now. You're not an orphan here today. I'm talking to somebody who has mountain debt or someone whose business has fallen or somebody who's losing a home. I'm talking to you here today, and worry is trying to get a hold of you. I rebuke the spirit of worry in this house tonight in the name of Jesus Christ. I said, I rebuke that spirit in the name of Jesus Christ. I command that spirit of worry to leave because there are some people in this house you trust in a God who feeds the birds of the air. 
you trust a God here today who dresses the lilies of the field. You trust in a God who is able to keep you in the palm of his hands. You trust in a God who said, cast all your cares upon me for I will care for you. You are not an orphan. You trust in a God who said, though mother and father will forsake you, I will never forsake you. I will never leave you, but I will adopt you as my children. You trust in that God. And so I'm opening up this altar right now. If you have ever been through that spirit or you're going through it right now the spirit of worry we come against it in the name of Jesus and we're going to pray against it in the name of Jesus right now all over this building